Today's speaker, we have Jan Kuhn. Jan is the founder of WhatsApp. Uh, WhatsApp, as we mentioned in earlier uh, iteration of this, is the, the startup that did everything right. Um, after not getting, uh, after trying to get jobs at Facebook and not uh, for either Jan or Brian, um, they put their heads down, they figured out a product that people really wanted, and while everybody else in Silicon Valley was going to conferences, doing PR, whatever else it is people do other than making a product that people really love, um, WhatsApp just quietly built this thing that was used by how many people at the time of the acquisition? Uh, 450. 450 million people uh, for a consumer app and more than a billion now. Um, and it was acquired by Facebook a couple of years ago. And Jan can tell that story. But thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Sure. Um, thanks for having me. So when Sam asked me to, to come and speak here, I think I made some smart ass comment how I'm going to speak about like. People actually building a product and not not going to class or something like that. Um, but as Sam mentioned, we were just fortunate uh, in a way that we stumbled into something that people really wanted. And um, I'll explain in a second how we got there. But the credit really goes to um, not necessarily uh, uh, us having some brilliant idea. I think the credit goes to like. Also being in the right time and the right place and building a product that, that people wanted and just realizing that, that people wanted it. So uh, just to kind of give the, the quick history of how we got where we got, we actually, uh, both me and my co-founder Brian, we were at Yahoo for about, uh, I was there for nine years, he was there for 11 years. And that time was actually really, really valuable for us to learn um, how to scale uh, backend servers, how to, uh, what makes a good product, what makes a bad product. And uh, uh, kind of seeing the, the Yahoo as a company get really successful and then kind of, you know the story. So um, we left in 2007, just coincidentally, we both left around the same time, like within a month difference. And we took some time off, um, we took about a year off. So, so we left in 2007, we took all of 2008, off. Uh, he moved to New York with his girlfriend. I was just like goofing off. And um, and I really kind of fell in love with my Nokia phone. I had this this candy bar, I think it was 6610 Nokia phone that I jailbroke. I installed like a Netmon software on it, which showed you like which mobile cell you were connected to and like all this advanced things you could do with a phone that you couldn't do when you took it out of the box. And so uh, at the end of 2008, I went traveling. I went to Argentina. I went to uh, Russia, to Ukraine, to Hungary, to Israel, to a bunch of countries. So I was gone for like two, three months on and off. And what I found really hard during the time was just keeping in touch with my friends, especially in Argentina. I don't know if anybody here is from Argentina or been to Argentina. Like, there you go. So one person. What's with your dialing codes? Like, it's so complicated. I could never understand it. Um, and so when we were in Argentina, just like having people call us or me calling people was like, I went and got a local SIM card, but I couldn't figure out how people would call me because of these weird, complicated dialing codes and prefixes. And I was just like, oh. So this is how 2008 ends. And uh, January of 2009, uh, my birthday was coming up in February. And I figured like, I'll get myself an early birthday present. I'll go buy an iPhone. So I went to Apple store, bought an iPhone. and. Uh, right around the same time as SDK came out. I think uh, there was no SDK when iPhone first came out in 2007, but I think they released it in September of 2008. So I was like, literally three, four months after iPhone came out, uh, sorry, after uh, iOS SDK came out, I got an iPhone and I started like tinkering with it. I was also really bored and I had a lot of free time. So I'm like, okay, well, let's install this weird thing called Xcode. Luckily I had a Mac. Um, uh, let's install Xcode, let's figure out what, what can be done, let's build a sim simple app. And then you kind of like realize, holy shit, it has full internet connectivity and it can do full TCP IP stack. So it basically is a little computer that can talk to your server. So I'm like, okay, cool, uh, what, what can we do with it? So the first thing that we built, which uh, I don't know how many of you know this is the history of WhatsApp. The first thing that we built was actually this concept of a status. And so the idea was, if you ever used, uh, and you all might be young for this, if you ever used something like AOL, uh, AIM, or ICQ, or IRC, or any of these products, 
you have this concept of a status, like Yahoo Messenger had this like away from keyboard, or I'm busy, or I'm in a meeting. And so the first thing that you would do when you use those messengers is you would like, the first message you would send was, hey, are you there? That was like the first message you sent to start a conversation with somebody on like ICQ or if you private message somebody on IRC. Because people would be away and so they would use the status to kind of indicate like I'm not near a computer or I'm AFK or whatever. And so the idea was like, well, let's take this concept of status and just like apply it to your phone. So before people call you, they can check your status. Like maybe you're busy, uh, maybe you're in a meeting, maybe you're traveling, whatever. So if you don't pick up, at least people know why you don't pick up. And that was kind of like the uh, WhatsApp uh, 1.0 uh, application. And what we built was the, the app that uh, hooked into your address book. So the other thing that kind of worked in our favor was there were address book APIs on the mobile phone. They didn't really exist on a desktop, right? If you think about desktop, uh, like Windows, uh, from uh, 2000 to 2008-ish, people never really put address books on their desktops. Um, people always had address books on their mobile phones. And so even if the API existed, there was like nothing to query because the address book database was empty on all these, uh, on all these devices. And so luckily, the, the one thing that Apple uh, opened was their address book APIs, which was great for us. So what we did was, sorry, we basically went through the address book and we could figure out if the contact in your address book was another WhatsApp user. And that's basically how the status worked. We would take your phone number, and if it was an international phone number, we would try to like normalize it to the plus format. So your phone numbers would start, all of the phone numbers in our system would start with a plus in the full international format. And we would be able to detect if the other person is a, is a, a person on a WhatsApp network, a user of, of our product. And the idea was that before you start, before you start a phone call or before you send a message, you would check the status of this person uh, from WhatsApp, and they would say, "Oh, I'm available," and you would call them. Right. So that was the WhatsApp 1.0. It failed horribly. Like it was a disaster. It was depressing. Um, nobody, nobody used it. People downloaded it, actually, surprisingly enough. And I think people downloaded it because there were like no apps back at the time. There were like maybe. I don't know, 1,000 or 2,000 apps in the whole app store because it just, it just went live. So we, we, we benefited from being early, but the idea wasn't that great. So uh, people would download, and they, they just like never use it. People just call people like they normally would. It was really hard to replace like a native dialer, and that's kind of what we wanted to do. We wanted to replace a native dialing application. So um, we, we struggled for a little bit. We kept adding all these like, weird features in retrospect. Back then we thought they were like the best thing ever. Like you could set your status to automatically change at a certain time of day. Like if you knew you were always in a meeting from like two to four, you could like automatically configure it to always say that you're in a meeting from two to four. So it kind of had like that functionality. And then something happened around the summer of 2009, Apple introduced push notifications. So back then, if you wanted the application to wake up, the only way to wake it up was a user tapping on the application icon. And there was no way to do anything in the background which in retrospect was really backwards because I don't know if any of you know about Nokia Symbian phones, but like S60 and Blackberry had all this capability even before iPhone came out to do uh, auto start, to do background multitasking, to do networking, to do all of the stuff. And so like iOS actually limited what we can do. So we were like struggling. And then Apple introduced push notifications. We were like, hallelujah. So we, we ended up uh, hooking into Apple push notifications. I think this was like around the summertime, uh, even before they were still in beta because we had developer access. And we, we noticed that people were using the status as a way to kind of communicate with each other. They would change the status to say like, I'm going to a bar. And like the, the, the change in status would like broadcast and go to all the other uh, people who use WhatsApp in their address book. And so around the summer of 2009, we were like, huh, interesting. Maybe we should build messaging. And then it all kind of clicked, uh, because I've always used SMS. And uh, if you remember on the old Nokia phones, the SMS was not threaded. So you would get a message that would show up as a phone number. And if you get another message from that person, it would show up as just like another entry in your, in your list. And then iOS came out, and they introduced threaded SMS. And everybody went like, wow. So we kind of said, OK, well, 
we can do full networking, we can do TCP IP, we can connect phone, if your phone is a client, to, to a server on the back end. Um, we already had all this code to figure out if you're a WhatsApp user or not. We could take your phone number, um, parse it, figure it out, figure out all the like international prefixes. We even figured out Argentina at some point, which was not an easy thing to do, but we got there. So, so we got we got to to a state where we could actually send messaging, uh, have people send messages over WhatsApp. And if you look at our application today. You see all these features, you see group chat, you see ability to send media, to record voice messages, to do all the stuff. We didn't have any of it. We didn't have like, the only thing we had was one-on-one -on -one messaging, that's it. Just think how, how antiquated that is. And that's what we launched with. So around September, I think it was September-ish, maybe, maybe late August, early September, uh, is, is um, maybe even early October, I actually don't remember, is when we launched messaging. Um, and it took off. And, and it was intuitive to us why it took off, because SMS was so expensive back in those days, right? And especially international SMS. So if you had two people who were living in two different countries, how did they communicate? Uh, well, they could send each other SMS, it was expensive. Uh, they could use Skype, but Skype mostly worked on a desktop, so you had to like synchronize the time when both of you are in front of a computer. And you know, people usually are not. Like some of you have computers open, but if you get a Skype call now, you're not gonna answer it, right? So there was really no good way for people to like communicate in real time. And so that's why SMS was so popular, because your phone was always with you. It was always in your pocket. It was always, no matter where you went, you had your phone with you. So when you sent an SMS, you never said, hey, are you there? Like you never did that. You just sent an SMS. The only thing sometimes you could say is, hey, did you get my message? Because SMS was so unreliable, especially internationally. And so that was the other problem that we could solve by building on top of TCP IP is we could add reliability in our protocol. So we rolled out messaging, we made it super reliable. Um, we added all these visual indicators. You knew if the message actually was successfully delivered to a server. You knew if it was successfully delivered to the device that you were sending it to. And, and it just took off. And, and when, when Sam talked about like, well, we kind of like, went heads down and we didn't go to conferences and we didn't do a whole lot of other stuff. It's just because we were lucky. We stumbled into something that people really, really had a need for. Just think about SMS back in 2006, 2007, right? There was no iMessage. Um, nothing else worked on your phone. Um, SMS was expensive. It was horribly limiting. You can only send 160 characters at a time. And if you sent a longer message, it would break it into multiple chunks and sometimes like, sometimes, like the chunk at the bottom would arrive first, so you have to like read the message at the bottom and then read the message on top for, uh, after that. Um, media was horribly expensive and it was not working well across platforms, so if I sent like a video recorded on Nokia phone to Blackberry users, they probably couldn't have watched it. Or if you sent a video recorded on Blackberry to iPhone, it probably wouldn't work either. So we had all these limitations with SMS that we were trying to address in our product. And Obviously, the biggest one was cost. SMS was very expensive in Europe and, and uh, in many countries outside of North America. And we just uh, kept going. So once we figured out that there is a need for it, we were like, well, we better hire. So we hired some of our old friends from Yahoo, uh, uh, from, who left Yahoo, some of our ex-Yahoo uh, friends. We hired, uh, I hired a friend of mine who I actually met when I were, was working at Stanford, uh, like when I was doing IT at uh, Graduate School of Business in like 96, 97-ish, back when I was in high school. So he came and he helped work the, on a BlackBerry client. And so our goal was like, okay, well, we gotta build all these features, but we also gotta build all these platforms. Because we started out with iPhone, but the world back then was very different. Nokia actually was majority <laughs> smartphone uh, platform back in the days. Not in North America, but if you kind of looked at the rest of the world, everybody was using Nokia smartphones. Um, and BlackBerry, and Android I think didn't even exist or just barely existed in, in the end of 2009 and early 2010. So we had to build for Nokia, and uh, we had to find people who could actually build for Nokia, uh, Symbian S60, and we had to find those people in Europe because nobody in Silicon Valley even heard of Nokia. So we got lucky, we found two really good engineers to help us build that. Funny story about our Nokia client, um, it, it actually built on top, it, it's actually built using Python. Not a lot of people know that actually Nokia 60 had a Python runtime. So I remember when, when Brian, my co-founder, he, he, he started looking at Nokia because we knew that we had to do Nokia, so he kind of went away for a week. He comes back a week later. He's like, you're not gonna believe this. 
you can build, you can build, you, you can use Python to build a client. I was like, no way, get out of here. He's like, no, 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 seriously, you don't understand. You can run Python on this little tiny phone. I was like, okay, let's try and do it. And that's what we did. The, the, the basic was a whole backend, the communications, the protocol was all in Python and the UI was actually in, in C++. Um, so we started working on building multiple platforms and we started working on building features. Uh, so we launched BlackBerry, we launched Nokia 60, we launched Android all within a few months of each other in 2010, and then we started building features. So we had to build what people asked us to build. Um, people wanted group chat. Everybody's like, this is great. I love your product. I want to have a group conversation with my family, or you know, three friends, or five core workers, or 10 people in a study group, and we're like, Okay, well, how do we build group chat? Let's figure it out. So we like sit down and sketch the user experience, then figure out how to make the, the backend system work for group chat. And then people wanted, uh, obviously we had, very quickly we added multimedia. And I think multimedia is what really took us to the next level. Like once we added ability to send a picture, which today is like comical. Like how could you not have ability to send a picture through a messaging product over your smartphone? Back then, you couldn't. There was nothing that worked really well or was cheap or was reliable. So we added ability to send a picture, we added ability to send videos, we at some point introduced voice messages, and, uh, and then things just took off. And so at that point it was just scaling the backend. And this is where it kind of ties into what I was talking about earlier, where me and Brian worked at Yahoo. Because we spent so much time there, and because we were there in early days and we saw the company scale, we had all this experience to, to scale the back end. And we had, our own fair, we had our own share of outages and our service wasn't 100% perfect, but we would make sure that we would learn from an outage and make sure that we would add the right monitoring in place and we would have enough capacity always for holidays like Christmas and New Year's where the traffic spiked. But having that experience working at Yahoo um, learning how to scale the, the backend systems, learning how to tweak the operating systems, the kernels, the networking stack, the Ethernet driver if you have to, it all kind of tied together. So our experience at Yahoo, our experience with difficult um, or challenging SMS protocol that, that we'll use as a consumer, kind of all combined uh, with this perfect timing that happened in 2009, 2010 with smartphones coming online and people wanting to have this ability to communicate. And if you think about smartphone, it, it's ultimately, like the, the messaging is a killer app for a smartphone. So we just basically like stumbled into the killer app because there's nothing else you do more with a smartphone than communicate. Most, most of it is probably talking to your friends and family and your loved ones, either over iMessage or WhatsApp or Skype or anything else. Yes, the guy from Virginia. Could you do it again? Huh? Could you make another app again that takes off? <laughs> a messaging app or just an app? Just any app. <laughs> I couldn't, I'm sure you can. <laughs> um, I already did it once. I mean, the chances of me being successful again are like zero. So the, the odds are on your side. So you should, you should go and do something. Um, so, so that's why we were able to actually spend all of our time um, heads down building a product because we had this amazing product market fit. We had this amazing uh, product that people wanted. They were like, give me, give me, give me. When we were rolling out Nokia S40, which was just like a step below Nokia S60, uh, which was kind of like a feature phone, people were like emailing us asking for like, when is it going to be done? When is it going to be done? When is it going to be done? And so there was like a huge pent up demand for any platform before we would launch it. And so that's why we didn't have like a need to go to the conferences and do a lot of PR or, or do anything like that um, because we had people who needed our product and we had like millions of people who were waiting for us to build a new feature or a new platform and that's why we were able to just go heads up and go heads down and, and, and uh, build a product. So that was kind of like the background that I wanted to give you on how we got started. Um, we can do a Q&A for the next 15, 20 minutes and uh, yeah. The specific thing I want to hear most about is how you dealt with the launch of the iMessage and Facebook Messenger and all of the other messaging platforms. Like WhatsApp was clearly first, and then it looked the world got scary quickly. How, how did you think about that? Uh, what was it like inside of the company? Um, so, how did we think about iMessage and all these other platforms? Well, so with iMessage, we when did they launch? I think 2011 ish. Something like that. I think 2011 at the uh, developer conference. So 
the, the world in Silicon Valley is very different from the world outside. So in Silicon Valley, if you look around, like 90% of people have an iPhone. Not only do they have an iPhone, they have like the latest, greatest iPhone. Um, outside of Silicon Valley, it's like 80 or 90% Android, right? Uh, so for us, having an iMessage launch was just like a small blip on a radar. What about Facebook Messenger? So Facebook Messenger, um, so I think Facebook for a very long time didn't really have a good messaging story. Uh, I remember they bought this company called Beluga, which I think it was Beluga. Uh, that was group messaging, so they were kind of focused on group messaging at first, and then they shut it down and turned it into Facebook Messenger. Um, but Facebook Messenger was part of the Facebook app. It wasn't really a dedicated app back in the days. But ultimately, if you look at a Facebook Messenger, the, the graph that the Facebook Messenger is using is very different from the graph on your phone. And if you think about people you add to your address book and people who you add on Facebook, there's going to be some overlap, but for the most part, it's going to be different. So people who I add on Facebook are probably not people who I'm going to message with a lot. And people who I put in my address book are people who are probably a different graph in terms of like how important they are to me. And if I add you into my, basically, if I exchange a number with somebody, it means I give them ability to like WhatsApp me, SMS me, or call me. There are probably a lot of people who I'm friends with on Facebook who, if, if they called me, I, I wouldn't. I would probably like first go like, who is this? Oh yeah, we we met each other once, and I added them. I'm probably not necessarily a typical example. I mean, I'm sure there are people who have different graphs uh, on different networks. I'm sure there are people who use WhatsApp only for work, and they only have their coworkers on, on the WhatsApp uh, on their, in their address book. Um, and uh, I'm sure that, that there are people who only have a certain set of, of their contacts in one or the other. But I think overall, this idea of like, well, if I add you to my phone, I give you permission to interrupt my life, is what makes our network a little different because people are people have these these connections that are stronger with people who they have in each other's address book. With 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 Facebook, you know, I have people I went to high school with, I have people I went to university with, and it's great that I can keep in touch with them on Facebook, but I wouldn't want them to call me like randomly out of the blue at 7 p.m. It would be just like awkward because I haven't talked to them for years. So so the graphs are different in that sense, and um, so so we always had kind of going back and generalizing it, we always had competition from like day one. We, there was actually a point in time where there was a new messaging app popping up like every month. And every month there was an article on TechCrunch how this awesome new messaging app is going to like take down all other messaging apps. And I don't know if they paid TechCrunch to write it or what. But, um, and we would just read this and we would go like, they have no users. How can you write that story in TechCrunch? It just like makes no sense. And, and obviously we didn't want to say anything because we don't want to draw attention to ourselves. We actually, on purpose, like tried to stand under the radar. But it was just like kind of funny to see this from, from, from the sidelines, all this kind of like dog and pony show that happened with all these apps. I mean, there was ping me, there was message me, there was group me, there was kick, there was, there were like, hello, there were like, 10 different messaging apps at some point, which kept getting all this publicity. And we were like, good for you. Have the publicity you want. We'll just send her the radar and not get, not have any attention uh, drawn to us. So we always had competition, be it big guys like iMessage or Facebook Messenger, be it little guys like Kick. We always had competition. We always, even today, we still have apps like Telegram out there and, and, and Line and Kakao. But we always said that our destiny is really in our hands. Like we can't worry too much about competition. We have to worry about our product and our users. And if we spend a lot of time thinking about competition or looking at competition, we're going to fail. Yeah. And, um, so trying to build on what you just talked about this social graph, I mean, I mean, I feel like there's this whole social graph and it's actually now changing. Like, I mean, at least among me and my friends, I mean, I think I don't call people like so much. I don't really send them like, you know, SMS. I would probably add people mostly on this social media, like online, Facebook, or I could add them on like chat apps, like this WhatsApp and more. But I feel like this whole social graph, it is also like changing slowly because people call less and people send SMS less. People like to do it more on this social media platforms. Do you, do you have a view on that? And do you think there's any like opportunity on that? Or do you think do you think this shift is even true or? 
Um, I think, yeah, I think it's true. That, so the question was, uh, like, how, how is it, um, so the world is changing, people call less, and now, like, people add, like, the, the social networks all kind of, like, merge into one now. Um, yeah, you're right, I think people call less these days, and people mostly message each other. Um, I don't really know if we would do anything differently today, uh, or even back then. I think for us, the focus has always been on like, well, we'll, we want to provide a utility. We want to provide an application that is purely only about communication. So if you look at some other apps like VChat or Line or Kakao, they do a lot of different things, right? You can like order taxis through VChat and you can follow people online, like Line has a whole feed concept. And we always wanted to like build something that is really, really efficient and utilitarian and uh, also fast and reliable. I mean, not a lot of people can have the latest and greatest smartphone, right? A lot of people have Android phones that are low end. A lot of people have or used to have BlackBerry phones that didn't have a lot of horsepower and a lot of memory and a lot of CPU. So for us, it was always about reliability and efficiency of the app and not trying to do all these different things that a lot of different social networks and apps do. Uh, yeah. Uh, so how, how do you think about Messenger right now? Because now that Messenger integrated a lot of the features that WhatsApp had, I am starting to use Messenger a lot more. And that definitely takes away from the airtime of WhatsApp. So do you have an internal competition? No, I think internally there is still a lot of room for both apps to grow. Uh, I think Messenger is really strong in countries like North America, like the United States, for example. Uh, so I think we complement each other geographically. I think if you look at countries like India or, or uh, Israel or Hong Kong or Germany or Spain, WhatsApp has really strong foothold in those countries. And I think if you look at something like Australia or North America, you're probably going to see Messenger do really well. So a lot of it is also not necessarily uh, split by your graph, but also by the country you're in. Yeah. I appreciate the humility that you couldn't do it again with another app, but uh, I'm sure people ask you all the time you know, for help or advice. How do you determine if you hear an idea or look at an application if it can be really well? How do you think through that? It's very simple. Um, the question is how do you determine if, if an app uh, has a potential or, or is a good idea? Um, it has to solve a really basic problem. And it has to do it in a really simple and efficient way. I mean, going back to what we built, um, we, in some ways, solved a problem, right? People had problem communicating when they were not in the same room, uh, when they were in different cities or in different countries or in different time zones. And so uh, it's not that it wasn't impossible. It was just it was hard and it was expensive. And we made it easier and cheaper. And when you offer something to people that is easier and uh, cheaper, people, of course, will, will use it. So I think the number one thing to look at for me when I look at a product, um, does it solve a need and doesn't solve a need on a global scale, right? If you solve a need for people on Stanford campus, that's great. But can it scale to a billion or two billion people? If you solve a need for people only in Silicon Valley uh, by providing them chargers for their Teslas, Great, how many people have Teslas in the world, right? It's gotta be like a global, um, actually a lot of people have Teslas, I, I don't know. But it's gotta be like a, glo a global solution that applies to everybody in every country potentially, right? And so that was kind of like. That's something I see so many startups sort of get wrong, as you said, in Silicon Valley, everyone's got the iPhone 7S or whatever we're on now. How, how did you build that into the culture of the company to think about your users all around the world? I don't know. We got lucky with the people we hired. Um, and that was the other thing that I, that I didn't mention that I should have mentioned. We ended up with a really incredible team um, that we mostly hired out of our personal network from, from X Yahoo and from like friends of friends. We, I think ourselves had a really good understanding. I mean, me myself being an immigrant and like growing up in another country and going to all these other countries, I understood that that there was more to smartphone than just iPhone. That was like the thing that everybody talked about and wrote about in 2008 and 2009. So like for me, especially as somebody who really liked Nokia phones uh, before Nokia went out of business, I was like, we got to build for Nokia because they're great phones and there's like a billion Nokia smartphones out there. 
Um, so I think just me and my co-founder having that perspective probably distilled through the company and people understood that, um, hey, you know, that you don't want to just build for iPhones. You don't want to just build for the latest and greatest. You have all these millions of phones out there, um, billions of phones out there that you got to build for because you want those users to be using your product. And they also were asking us to do that. Yeah. Can you talk about the business side um, as far as incorporation, equity, and raising money? A business side, my favorite topic, sure. Um, so we incorporated on my birthday on February 24th of 2009. And the reason I, like, my, the thinking that was going through, and so, so let me back up. We were trying to submit an app into the Apple Store. And I didn't want to do it under my own name. Like, I didn't want the app to say Jan Kuhn, because I figured, like, who would want to install an app made by some guy? So I figured, like, we should probably be more official. We should have, like, a company. I'm like, OK, so go to Google. How do you start a company, right? It's just, like, step, step one. Um, so I got a friend of mine. Uh, he, was, uh, he was an insurance broker, so he had his own company. And he was like three blocks away from me in Santa Clara, where, where, um, where I lived. And so um, I went to his office, because I used to buy insurance for my car and my house from him. And so I was like, dude, how did you incorporate? He's like, oh, it's easy. You take these articles of incorporation. It's like one page with like five things written in it. And you go to San Francisco to the state uh, building, the secretary of state or whatever. And he gives them $100 and they stamp it and you're done. I'm like, no way, it can't be that easy. He's like, yeah, it's that easy. I'm like, all right. So um, we had to submit an app, and, and they wanted us to show, like Apple Store wanted us to actually send them a copy of the incorporation articles. So it was like, OK, easy. I have nothing to do that day. I'm like, drive to San Francisco, get lunch, go to his office, get a stamp, get a letter, great. Um, send it to Apple. They, they look at the letters. They're like, yep, you're legit. You're a company. You can now submit under the name WhatsApp. I'm like, cool. Submitted an app uh, under the name WhatsApp. So that was how we incorporated. Um, in terms of, in terms of, it's it's easier than it sounds. Back then it was like a struggle for me because I never done it. Um, how did we think about money or, or or the whole funding thing? So we we left Yahoo um, with some savings because Yahoo did really well in in uh, late '90s, early 2000s, and so we had stock, we had options, we had RSUs. And so I was actually able to like not only take a year off, obviously not do anything extravagant, but uh, like live off my savings for a year. And then I had enough money to where while I was still tinkering around with an app and we didn't have exuberant costs, I, I actually remember like when we started out, I was using my buddy's server, this guy Chuck, um, who also used to work at Yahoo. Um, he used to run Yahoo Sports. And so like I used to sit next to the Yahoo Sports team, so we became friends. So I was like, hey, Chuck, can I use your server? I don't want to pay $20 a month for a server. He's like, yeah, sure. So like, you know, saving $20 a month on the server was a big deal for me. Um, and so we would run like originally on his server. And I remember at some point, as we launched messaging and like saw all this grows, he's like, dude, you got to get your own servers. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm fine. I don't want to pay for my own servers. He's like, no, 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 you got to get your own servers. You're like taking up all this CPU and bandwidth. And like, I'm like, no, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. So eventually like he kicked me out of his, kicked me off his server. Um, and and uh, which was great because we switched from Linux to FreeBSD, which we all loved and we had experience with uh, at uh, at Yahoo. And so um, we were able to actually for a long time live off our savings. And um, since we had all this experience on how to run the company efficiently when it comes to like servers and backend and bandwidth and everything, there was not a lot of expense. The expense started when we had to go hire people, and the. The idea was that, okay, well, we need, we're going to have to pay for more servers. We're going to have to pay for bandwidth. We're going to have to pay for SMS verification because to sign up on WhatsApp, you have to verify your phone number. And um, we did a small angel round. I um, can't even remember. I think it was end of 2009. Um, we did a small angel round. And then we basically kind of kept our company running without losing too much money because in early days, iPhone app was actually paid. Like people had to pay a dollar to download iPhone app, while everything else was free, like Android and BlackBerry and Nokia. And so we had people paying for iPhone app, and that kind of went to 
to, uh, it gave us ability to pay for the bill, to, for electricity, for bandwidth bills, for server bills and all that stuff. And I think probably around 2011, 2010, 2011, uh, people started knocking on our door. Like we didn't even went out to, to look for money, which is a great situation to be in because like if you're gonna go and raise and you need money, you're probably not gonna get the terms you want. Um, which is, you know, for us was uh, kind of worked in our favor because all these VCs started coming, VCs started coming to us and they're like, you guys are doing great. We want to partner with you. We want to give you money. And we're like, eh, we don't really need it, which makes them want to invest even more. So, um, so, so we kind of play, we kind of did this dance where we were like, no, no, we, we don't really want your money. Come back in a few months. And, and eventually, like after all these conversations, me and Brian sit down and we're like, okay, well, we, we just wasted their time and our time. Should we just take funding or should we not? And we decided that we should because it's better um, to have money in your bank account for your business than not. And that's the words of wisdom that I got from Jeff Ralston, who, you know, because Jeff was like, if you can have money in your bank account, you should have money in your bank account because you never know if you need to buy a building or if you need to buy some office space because you're starting growing too quickly. And you don't want to negotiate and raise money when it's too late. Like, you want to do it when you don't need money. So, listening to words of wisdom of Jeff Ralston, we were like, okay, let's get some funding. And we partnered with Sequoia and we got money from Sequoia. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Could you sort of walk us through your like internal psychology and confidence over the trajectory of the company? Like at the beginning, did you identify that the market timing was pretty spot on or were you just sort of like following what your users were, were saying to you? I think until we did messaging, when we're doing that dinky status feature, obviously it was rough because we had no users and nobody used our product. And so you're like sitting there in your room building a product and thinking like, well, nobody wants it. Like, why am I doing this? What is the meaning of life and all that stuff, right? And so. And so you kind of like, it's, it's tough, right? When you're building a product that, that people don't really want, you feel rejected, you feel like, why aren't you using it? It's great, I put all my energy in it. Um, so, so once we added messaging, it was like 180 degrees difference, right? All of a sudden, everybody wants our product, everybody thinks it's the coolest thing ever, we get all these letters into our own email uh, inboxes, all these emails from people saying like how great your product is, I'm able to keep in touch with my fiance, I got married because of your product, your product helped me like save life because the hikers were lost and the hikers were able to use WhatsApp share location to send, like it's just night and day, right? When, when people want your product and they love your product, the, the psychology inside a company is just different. Like people would come into work and, and they would be like, we're building the best thing ever, people love the product, this is great. And so we didn't really have to do a lot of selling even to the candidates. Like people who came into interview with us basically fell into two camps. People who live in a Silicon Valley bubble and never heard of WhatsApp and they'll be like, why would I want to work for WhatsApp? And people who kind of fell into like, well, there is a whole world out there bubble. And they were like, you guys have millions of users. Like my cousin in Spain or my friend in Germany was telling me about your product and everybody uses it. Or people would say, I went to India or I went to Middle East and everybody uses your product. It's like amazing how come nobody heard about you and they're like, well, that's on purpose. And so like basically we had like these, these two types of people we would interview. And so obviously people who had a, like a Silicon Valley bubble didn't even want to like come work for us, which is not the end of the world because there were plenty of people who understood there was a whole big world out there and they were happy to build product for hundreds of millions of users all over the world. Yeah. You want to get some questions? How was the fundraising experience? <coughs> why did you partner with Sequoia? Uh, why did we partner with Sequoia? So we had a few. We had a few companies give us term sheets. One of them even gave us a blank term sheet. They're like, fill out the number you want. <laughs> and we were like, well, if they're that that uh, irresponsible with other people's money, maybe we shouldn't. We shouldn't do that, shouldn't partner, be partnering with them. Um, Sequoia is just an amazing brand, right? Like, for me, uh, living in Silicon Valley since 1992 and reading articles and seeing news about all these companies that went public, like Netscape and Cisco and Google, um, 
and uh, knowing that a lot of them were backed by Sequoia just made it um, not a very difficult decision to pick Sequoia. Um, we also really like people who work there. A lot of it is just personal chemistry. A lot of it is, is the uh, VC company understanding how much to be hands-on or not. Like Sequoia was actually really great about, like the, they, they knew the numbers, they knew we were growing. They didn't meddle, right? They didn't need to come in and say, you guys doing this wrong or doing that wrong. Like there was no need for that. And, and I think we had that understanding up front where they kind of made us a promise. We're like, we're here for, uh, to help you financially. We're not here to help you with management. We're not here to help you write code. We're not here to help you like build features. We're here just to help you grow and to help you financially. And if you need any help outside of that, come knock on our door and we'll try to help. And, and they were really helpful with stuff when we asked, like recruiting or anything like that. They would, they would sometimes meet with prospective candidates and tell them why they should join WhatsApp. So, so Sequoia was really great. Uh, it was a brand. Um, and, and I remember actually when we had multiple term sheets, me and Brian went to Jeff Ralston's house and we were, we were talking to him. It was late in the evening. We were trying to just get advice on what should we do. And he kind of like looked at all them and we talked through all the different term sheets. And then he kind of said, you know, like once you're a Sequoia company, you're a Sequoia company. It's like that, that branding is really strong and it means a lot. I have an important one. Yes, last one. <laughs> last one for you. But. How did you get your first few thousand users back in the days of the status product? Oh, well, how did we get our first few thousand users? So, so there was no apps back then. And, and iOS, um, well, it wasn't iOS back then. It was iPhone OS. Um, and the Apple Store had this category, new, uh, what's new? And the, the trick was to submit a new app, like, every few days. So you would always show up on top of what's new. And you would make a small change to the name. Because I think back in the old days, the name uh, difference triggered you as a new app. So we would basically have status and then we would say like, status for your smartphone, or like, status for your calls, or like, status for your iPhone, or um, updated status. Like we would basically tweak the name a little bit with every new version we submit, which always like kept us almost always at the top of the new category. And since there are no apps, people would go to what's new category all the time to download, to try to download uh, whatever people would build. Because like today you have thousands of apps, back days you had like hundreds. Uh, and basically by gaming the system a little bit, we were able to, I think that loophole got closed really quickly, but luckily by that time we already had messaging. Yeah. Um, how did you like scout up your company? I mean, how do you scout up like WhatsApp into different countries? How do we scale into different countries? Yeah. Um, we didn't have to scale. Well, we did have to do a couple of things. I take it back. So there were two things that we had to do. One, we had to build different platforms because there were some countries where like iPhone just didn't exist and everybody was using either Nokia or Blackberry or a combination of two. The second thing that we started doing early on is focusing on localization, right? So again, this kind of goes back to like Silicon Valley bubble where everybody in Silicon Valley speaks English. Therefore, the rest of the world must speak English. Not quite. So we, we focused early on on localization. We actually hired people internally into the company um, who were doing uh, two things. They were customer support representatives, so they would help people with problems and, and write FAQs and help debug issues. But they were also all multilingual. So we would hire somebody who was perfect in Spanish, and we would hire somebody who was perfect in German, and we would hire somebody who is perfect in Portuguese, and we would hire somebody who is perfect in Italian, and we would hire somebody who is perfect in all these languages where, where our apps were starting to grow so we could build a really good localized experience. So when you download WhatsApp in, in Brazil, it's not in English, it's in Portuguese. And I think that is what helped us grow in all these countries. Yeah? How did you convince your first few employees, I know that they came from your personal network, but how did you convince them to join you? Uh, it wasn't hard, most of them were unemployed. So let me see. Uh, so Brian joined. So Brian left Yahoo, and he I think didn't really do anything for like. I think he left in '98, so he didn't really do anything for like 10 years. He was one of the early Yahoo engineers. <laughs> so that was one. Uh, Chris, my friend, who I met from Stanford, he I think he was doing this startup that wasn't really going anywhere, and he was in LA, 
and he got married to this wonderful girl whose parents are actually from here. So like, I think for her, it was an advantage to move here to be closer to her parents. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, you guys should move, you guys should move here, like move back to Northern California. Um, so, so it's a combination of like her wanting to move to be closer to, to her parents and like him not really doing anything and not having a full-time job also contributed. Um, uh, this guy, Eugene, who was one of our early hires, he, he was working at a company. Uh, he, I actually knew him through my social network. We, were, we, we are and still friends. And like he would always complain how, how he hated his job and how they were like trying to screw him over by like promising him stock options and never delivering. It was like he hated it. So I'm like, well, the, the, there's a good opportunity. Um, we had, let's see who else. We hired this guy, Michael, who was in New York, wasn't really doing anything also. So he was a referral through a friend of mine from Yahoo. So there, there was this guy, Michael Radwin, who I used to work with at Yahoo, who was working at a startup. And we would keep in touch. And at some point, I was complaining to him how hard it is to find good engineers that are smart and capable and can get shit done and don't just like sit there and theorize. And he was like, oh, I know a guy. Calls this guy Michael in New York. And so like we randomly called this guy Michael in New York. And I'm like, hey, Michael, I got your name from other Michael. Like, do you want to come and interview? And I figured like he would say, no, I'm pretty happy in New York. But he wasn't really doing much. He's like, yeah, OK. So he came in and interviewed. And so um, we had, let's see, we had one of the guys, one of our engineers was in Russia, this guy Igor. Um, he wasn't really doing much in Russia also. It's not like they have Silicon Valley in Russia. <laughs> So we were like this band of outcasts in some way, like uh, the, the group of people who weren't really doing much who got together and, and built the product. Um, but there were also people who were working full time who actually had to like try really hard to convince to join. Like one, one of the guys, um, Rick, who helped us a lot with the backend as we were scaling the backend, he was working at Yahoo. And so like I think it took us six months of, of meetings and dinners with me and Brian trying to convince him and we would meet him. And we would do it like in a very subtle way, not like come join us. We we're like, oh, you know, we have all these users and we have all this skin. And we knew that he was like really, really technical and he loved solving problems. So we weren't saying like, come join us and, you know, we'll give you lots of money or options or whatever. We were like playing a different angle. We were saying like, hi, Rick, if you're watching this. We were like, hey, Rick, you know, we're having all these technical problems and we did. And we're like, we just don't know. There was like, this weird issue with FreeBSD 8 where like it competes for kernel resources with Erlang and Erlang is trying to like run on these 48 cores and we don't know how, how they're like, there's some contention in the kernel, if only we could figure it out, we just need some help. And like, and we knew that he loved doing this kind of stuff, right? So like, so with him we played a different angle. It took us a few months to convince him, but eventually he joined and he helped us fix a lot of bottlenecks in our system. So, so there were all different stories, but I think the, the bulk of the, the initial kind of, um, core of people who joined that were from our professional and personal networks. We are out of time, unfortunately. Oh, man. I think you're going as long as you're going. <laughs> if you, all right. If you got, I have time. All right, we'll go do one more question. Thank you. Sure. Um, I think uh, what happens to the role model of being focused, I want to understand your um, decision-making process. How, when you get feedback from users, how you define it as a noise to your product, how you define it as a key feature we need to improve, and how you define, uh, how you uh, find out that the efficiency of communicating is a core feature you want to focus on for so many years. How do we know what features to build and what features not to build? And you're absolutely right, because in the early days, people would write in and say, we want usernames or we want pins. Because people were so conditioned by all these messaging apps in, that came before us that you need to have a username or pin. So like, if you were using BBM or if you were using ICQ, you had like some random pin that you would have to exchange with people. Or if you were using Skype or Yahoo Messenger, you had to have a username. And people didn't understand that what we were building was like this whole new idea of like, you don't need any of that stuff. You just sign up with your number and it's connected to your phone that has the same phone number and you go. And so in early days, a lot of feedback we took from users was useful. They're like, we want groups, we want multimedia, we want to have additional privacy controls, we want to turn off our last scene. Great, we built a lot of what people asked, but we also didn't build what people asked because we didn't think it was the right fit for our product. Like having the fundamental belief and the gut feeling that what you're doing is right and having that, that like vision of, it's just gonna work. I'm gonna build it using phone numbers. I'm not gonna have usernames. I'm not gonna have pins because it makes product more complicated. It makes product harder to use. People forget their usernames and pins and all that stuff. 
like having that that belief in yourself and, and the fact uh, and knowing that that what you're building is going to work is, is obviously also important. Um, so that's kind of how we would make decisions. Okay, you go, and then we'll get kicked out for the 1 p.m. class. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about the security issue or future security issue of uh, Messenger app? What do you feel about security issue, future security issue? Um, for us, well, we we um, as you know, we rolled out end-to-end -end encryption, and we weren't the first ones to do it. Obviously, there were apps before us that that focused on security, but we were the first ones to do it on such a global scale for everybody seamlessly, right? I mean, there there is no other app today that has more than a billion people that has end-to-end -end encryption enabled by default into everything you do, individual chats, group chats, and everything else. So we didn't start out, um, again, this kind of goes back to what we started with. It was just a pure one-on-one -on -one messaging, right? There was no group chats, there was no multimedia, there was no end-to-end -end encryption, there was no video calling, there was no voice calling, there was none of that. But over years, we made a commitment to our users that we were gonna add all these features and we were gonna make them work and make them work really well. And so obviously, we feel strong as that, Encryption is important, and we feel strongly about end-to-end -end encryption, which is why we added it, and which is why which is why we have it in our application today. Great, thank you thank so you. much. Sure.